Well, this is your life, and although this is the week that three astronauts splashed down after their record-breaking Skylab 2 adventure, I need hardly tell you I'm not on the moon. This is, in fact, a film studio set as a moonscape, because the man I'm expecting here is uh, an earthling with a difference. In fact, he knows the uh, moon like the back of his hand, although he's never been there in person. Now, he does expect this studio, he expects the photographer there, he expects a man in a space suit, but not this man. So that leaves me the one not knowing what to expect because he's a man of great speed, of unpredictability, and amazing ingenuity. Now, the countdown has begun because that signal means our man has arrived outside and we've got to get ready and let's see what happens. Very good. Now, come in. If you sit in this seat, right, okay, uh, you handle the camera more. as if you were sort of doing something. Uh, Look how at do you the do? pictures from down here. <laughs> <laughs> yep, right, okay. That's uh, perfect. Uh, yeah. If you take it down through here, through the... Uh, in fact, welcome, uh, welcome. Patrick Moore, star yeah. of Sky at nice Night. You. I'm part-time astronaut, nice Eamon Andrews. Because Hello. I want to tell you... Hello, you're going behind that. Because tonight, Patrick Moore, OBE, <laughs> this is your life. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't believe it yet, but it is. <laughs> Not really. Yes. I know that uh, we have a little distance to go. It's no distance in your terms, but if you'll take orbit with me, we have a lot of surprises waiting for you. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God>. Hmm. <laughs> oh, oh, there's a look. Patrick, you just didn't believe me there for a while, did you? I didn't. I've never been so taken aback in my life. I mean, people who know me say that I'm not very easily lost for words. Well, you, you certainly caught me out that time, <laughs> you swine. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you what he did afterwards. That's no, private. No, no. <clears throat> Censored. <laughs> Censored. Censored. Anyhow, Patrick Moore, this is your life and your reputation as a distinguished astronomer is worldwide, but you're best known, perhaps, to millions of ordinary viewers as the brightest star of that one-man space spectacular now in its 17th year on television, The Sky at Night. Now, you've brought the mysteries of space to firesides all over Britain, and we're going to start your story at a moment that belongs to world history, but that, for you especially, marked the moment of a lifetime. The date, July 21st, 1969, the time in England, 17 minutes past midnight. Man's first landing on the moon, Neil Armstrong talking there. But as commentator that night, you talk viewers through that great event on a television marathon and a double occasion for those millions of Patrick Moore fans who come to regard space as a special preserve of yours. And they're not far wrong. Patrick forecast that landing when he was 15. Oh. <laughs> the man who shared that unforgettable night of the first moon landing with you five years ago, fellow commentator and science expert, James Burke. <laughs> Uh, James, 15 is a bit young to be making major predictions. Well, apparently at the time he was the youngest member of the British Interplanetary Society and he said we were going to be on the moon by 1980 and they fell about and he was right. No, wait a minute, James. Now, wait, no, stop but, arguing. No, British, British, <laughs> but he's always arguing. No, British, all British arguing. Astronomical Association. I beg your pardon. The BIS was always convinced that we were going to be on moon landing. Uh, I wasn't the youngest uh, member and I was only one of all vast numbers of people who did it long before let's I Let's start did. all over again, James. What, what about other predictions you may have made? <laughs> Shut up, Patrick. Well, well, I was drawn to Cambridge. He probably forgets this but because, he, because he's modest, but we were on the, on the, in the studio that night and it was the middle of the night and we felt like you know what and they landed on the moon and the flight plan said take a rest to close down things and go to sleep for eight hours so we did a bit of program and then patrick passed me this note saying they are not going to go to sleep and i looked at it and looked at him and he went like that so we went off the air for 10 minutes and i went upstairs to the bigwigs and said we're going to be on all night they're not going to sleep 
And the one I talked to said, rubbish. And I said, bottle of champagne? And he said, yes. And I said, Patrick says. And we won the bottle of champagne. <laughs> I remember that, yes. <laughs> Is it, in fact, always, as you told me, quite an exhilarating experience working with this man? Oh, yeah. The first time I ever worked with Patrick on, I think it was Apollo, Apollo 8, 7 Apollo 8. 8. Apollo, Apollo 8. 8. He said to me, look, I'm a nobody. I'm just here to help. When you want me to help, say Patrick at the end of your sentence, and I will talk. When you want me to stop, blink, and I'll stop. And we always wondered whether we could go out to the pub and leave Patrick and come back 20 minutes later and sit down and blink. And Patrick would stop with perfect good sense. <laughs> I would say one thing, though, James. We did develop a kind of telepathy, didn't we? But we still got it. We could more or less cue, cue each other we're, uh, we're without saying you so. Did, you didn't know would I was you blink? tonight, did you? I'll blink. Shut up. Thank you, James. <laughs> Patrick, we're right now on Earth. This is your life, and it's a life that's spent when you're not traveling the world on scientific missions down in the little village of Selsey in Sussex, where you live with your 87-year-old mother. But if anyone thinks you turn your back on space when you're down there, let them take a look, as our cameras did when you weren't there, at the Patrick Moore moon base and a very important colleague of yours there. Hello, Patrick. Hello. Surprise. Hello, Raymond. Have you seen telescopes? All of them. Now we try to have a look at the study in his books. What? I didn't know about that. I and didn't. This is the room where Patrick does all his work. Over there is the most of his books. I don't know how many, between 40 and 50, perhaps over. I can't tell you. This is the desk where he does his writing on one particular favourite typewriter. Now, I don't know how many years back this goes, this interest, but it started really when he was six years old. And uh, I, I remember a wet, rainy day, he was bored and he was sitting near my bookcase. In it, he spotted two books. One was the story of the stars, the other was a story of the solar system, I think by Chambers. And from that time onwards, astronomy has always been his first love. And, well, it's grown from that, really. But your mother's not at home tonight. She's here. Oh, Mrs. No. Gertrude Moore. <laughs> yes, she is. <laughs> <laughs> And that's her seat right beside you, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> now, right beside you there, Patrick. Well, I told you not to. Wide right, Mrs. Moore. <laughs> now, Patrick. What she didn't add, though, was that, in fact, they were my mother's books when she was young, so she really started me on to it. And uh, there we are. Not only that, I believe she, Patrick, was, was responsible for, for you, uh, indirectly responsible, writing your guide to the moon. Not indirectly, directly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this was following a lecture you gave, wasn't it? Yes. What happened there when they rang up from New York, I think it was? Well, what actually happened was this. Um, I gave a lecture in London, and I called it Guide to the Moon because I was interested in the moon at that stage, and I was secretary of the BA uh, Lunar Section. It's always been, always been my main astronomical interest, really. And uh, uh, the once was a, a, a reporter there, and he rang up my mother, when I was away, actually, at East Quinto, our old home, and said, can I put a report of this into the New York press? Well, mother gave the right answer. She said, yes, OK, go ahead. If she hadn't, I wouldn't be here now. So a report went into the New York press, and it so happened, by sheer coincidence, that um, a big American publisher named W.W. W. Norton was looking for somebody to write a book about the moon, and they thought I just might be the man. So they contacted their London end, and the first thing I knew about it was that I had a request from the London publishers and the New York publishers to go up and discuss writing a book about the moon, which I proceeded to do. And write it. And it's that kind of resource that's to stand you in very good stead when the years roll on and your status as a television celebrity brings you into another unexpected field, this time as a radio panelist on the program Fair Deal. <laughs> and the chairman of that panel well oh. remembers the night you cracked a bottle with the rest of the cast. Cracked it, Eamon? You must be joking. He shattered it. The chairman himself here to recall that very tricky moment, David Nixon. <laughs> Tell us what happened on that particular incident. What had happened, Patrick had brought along some bottles of wine to this recording of Fair Deal, and we were just going on to do it, 
<laughs> and he said, let's have a quickie before we start. He said, quickie, won't do any harm. So we're all grown up, we have a quickie. So he got a litre bottle of wine between his knees <laughs> and he got the corkscrew going. Now, as a wine waiter, he's a very good scientist. <laughs> he, he's got very strong knees too, <laughs> because it's shattered. And when he stood up, he's a lovely shade of Nuit saint Georges from there down. <laughs> So we picked off as much of the broken glass as we could. Yes, I remember that. And we're due on. Yes. And he's very resourceful. I went on and introduced him, and he walked on backwards, <laughs> sat down at the desk, and steamed his way through the paper. <laughs> when, when he's not smashing bottles, what's he like to work with, Dan? Well, I think that you would describe Patrick as, uh, as a natural comedian. In other words, it's very hard to get a word in edgeways. Yes, <laughs> but, I've noticed that. Eamon, you know very well, more than anybody, probably, that public images don't always match up to the real person. But in this gentleman's case, he is one of the kindest and most generous people you will ever meet. And he's something much more than that. He's the world's greatest enthusiast. And it's <laughs> lovely to see you on this panel. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Patrick, you were born in Finner, Middlesex, but you're brought up in the quiet town of East Grinstead in Sussex, where your late father was an accountant. Your holidays are spent on the Sussex coast, and there you are, age three, at your grandmother's home Good in Bognor. And we've another snap here of oh, you, no. age four, no. oh, on the right. sands. <laughs> Not the other one, no. You're an energetic youngster even then. In fact, Mrs. Moore, Patrick wrote his very first book, didn't he, when he was only eight. Do you remember, <laughs> Mrs. Moore, when he I thought he was remember. a bit young to become an author, you said, and he had an answer for you. Yes, and he said we're going to write it very simply because he'd write it in simple language for the young so that mother could understand it. <laughs> Eight at the time, yes. Well, despite that flying start, the onset of a weak heart at your prep school prevents you from continuing ordinary schooling and instead you're educated by a private tutor. And do you know he talked just as fast <laughs> even in those days? That same tutor from more than 33 years ago, still vicar of Coleman's Hatch, Hartfield, Sussex, at the age of 84, the Reverend oh, John Misson. <laughs> Tell me, was, was Patrick a bright pupil, Mr. Miss? He was, no. he was indeed. <laughs> and if he didn't know any particular subject well, he would try and prove he was a great fool. And he did it so cleverly, you know, he wasn't a fool, whatever else he might be. <laughs> and I've never known him depressed and faithful to all his friends and uh, a really great guy. Came and opened a do at our place and he, somebody said, do people recognize you? He said, yes, a woman came up the other day and said, you are Billy Graham, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, John Wilson. Yeah, what, you, what you haven't said there is, what you haven't said is the tremendous help that he gave me. Because um, I wasn't awfully easy, I know, and um, if he hadn't taught me so brilliantly, I certainly wouldn't be here, and I shall never be sufficiently grateful to you for that. Well, that's a double Never be sufficiently grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there you are. A fine report from pupil and from tutor. But just to keep the record straight, uh, let's jump ahead again for a moment to a day in your future television career when for once even Patrick Moore really couldn't cope. The scene is the crater of the erupting volcano Mantidi in Tenerife. And it's Patrick Moore reporting. Look at all that foul cast... Look at all that forecastic... Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Blast and hell. <laughs> now, an active career like that looked unlikely for you as a schoolboy, and when schooling ends, uh, you're prevented from taking up that university place that's uh, open to you because it's wartime. And determined to do your bit, you volunteer first for the Home Guard in East Grinstead. The orders to your unit are to watch out for German parachutists, but you manage to alert your comrades for another kind of lookout duty. Patrick got us all stargazing on sentry go. Your comrade in arms in the Home Guard 30 years ago and a friend to this day, Patrick Clark. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick's knowledge of the stars came in very handy one night on duty, didn't it? Well, oh, Lord. Well, <laughs> I know. Yeah. Well, what happened was one of our comrades, shall we call him that? Yes, yes. Three o'clock in the morning, charged to the guard room and announced in a loud voice that he'd seen a flare from a German bomber. <laughs> well, if you can imagine it, in that age, we all knew then that the invasion had begun. So we all ran, ran around to collect rifles and goodness knows what. Patrick charged out looked over to the sky and said, you 
idiot. It's Venus arri <laughs> arriving in the sky, you know, it's so stupid. <laughs> but I believe that Pat, after the war, his enthusiasm for knowledge that we all know, helped a son of yours. Oh, Lawrence, you mean, yes. Um, yes, indeed. What happened here was that Patrick took him firmly by the shoulders and <laughs> gave him an, an intense tutorial course oh. lasting how many months, several months. I really forget, a long time ago. Yes, and, um, well, anyway, Lawrence got into the Harding Lye College and, uh, well, eventually he got a first at Oxford. And Lawrence is here too. Come in, oh, Lawrence no. Clark. <laughs> Thank you, Lawrence, and thank you, Patrick Clark. Thank you. <laughs> now, that gift for teaching is to be used again, but first you have to fulfill your determination to do your part in the war effort. In 1941, you managed to persuade the RAF doctors that you're 100% fit and you join the Royal Air Force, not as a desk officer, but as air crew. Now, you've done all sorts of weird things during the war, but Patrick Moore's knowledge of the stars made him a natural choice to be navigator with Bomber Command. And in January 1945, near the war's end, and on a routine mission with the crew, he faced his narrowest escape. He was flying at 19,500 feet in a Wellington bomber when the wings iced up and the aircraft went into a vertical spin. At 4,500 feet, he and the rest of the crew were ordered to bail out of the stricken bomber as it plunged towards the ground. I handed Patrick his parachute and in a split second we faced a life or death decision. The wireless operator on that plane, spiralling to destruction 29 years ago, you have not seen him since that day. Ex-Flight Lieutenant Guest Dempster. Good Lord! I guess you say a life or death decision. Good Tell Lord. us what happened exactly. Good Lord. Well, after the aircraft, uh, we gained control of the aircraft. Uh, the parachute was pulled inside it, so that meant that either two had got to go down on one or we all stuck together. Good Lord. So we stuck, didn't we? Yeah, we did, yes. And we crash landed at St. David's. I me yes, I remember that very you well, yes. yes. And we decided to stick because of the spirit this chap engendered amongst the crew. Good Lord. And and it's you'll... lovely to see you again. It's Thank great you, to see Guest you, Dempster. believe me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, when your RAF service ends, you return to civilian life to become a school teacher. The school is Homewood House, Langton Green in Kent, and you take up your profession of schoolmastering with typical verve. I don't know how we managed before Patrick's arrival or how he survived when he left. Co-founder of that school you taught her 25 years ago, Mrs. Mary Trotter. <laughs> Well, Patrick joined you as your history master, Mrs. Trotter, but he took on rather more responsibilities than that, didn't he? I've never known such enthusiasm or energy. He worked at, Patrick worked a 20-hour day. <coughs> Sometime in the evening, you used to settle down and write your science fiction until the small hours, <laughs> popping out every now and again to look through the... Uh, telescope. Yes, I remember that. Yes, very well indeed. I, I once, got, I once um, got marooned um, on the roof, do you remember? <laughs> I went out, w went out um, via the bathroom and the, the window slammed shut and I couldn't get back. It was most embarrassing, actually. <laughs> it so happened that the only way back was through, was, 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 through the, was, well, was through the matron's room and that just wasn't on. <laughs> that wasn't enough. He wrote our first school song, Words and Music. Oh, I remember Thank that. Thank you, Mrs. Yes. <laughs> it was great to see you. <laughs> Well, there's no doubt at all, Patrick, that you left a lasting imprint on that school, and though you moved on to other things in 1952, your name is still one to conjure with down there at Homewood House, where today there's a whole new generation of yeah. Patrick Moore fans, and some of them are here in your audience tonight with Assistant Headmaster Sandy Helm. There they are. Oh, no. <laughs> And Patrick, writing that school song was just another of your accomplishments. Amid it all, you found time to write an opera, Perseus and Andromeda, <laughs> composed by Patrick Moore. It will have its world premiere later this year in Shoreham in Essex. So now... Sussex! 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 Let's now go over to a certain Sussex. rehearsal room to hear from the musical director of your opera, Ray Lowry. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Hello, Patrick. Do you remember the time I came over to your house in Selsey? and you played through the opera for me. It was a very memorable experience because you play as fast as you talk. <laughs> well, as you remember, I like the opera very much and we formed the Shoreham Light Opera Company who are going to produce the opera later this year. And now, just specially for the composer, here are a few members of the company to sing one of the choruses for you.
Thank you, the Shoreham Light Opera Company, and come in, Ray Lowry. <laughs> the first time I've ever heard that song. In four parts. Yes, I've never heard a song before at all, period. Right. Well, I hope you liked it. Well, I did. It's terrific, yes. But don't worry, Patrick. It was only a rehearsal. Oh, we terrific. Should be, we should be note perfect by October. <laughs> don't worry about that. Thank you, Ray Lowry. Thank you. Now, while you're still a schoolmaster, your career as a writer blossoms with thrillers and adventure stories as well as your serious scientific works. In 1965, you devote yourself full-time to astronomy as director of the planetarium of the Arma Observatory. But it's in February 1957 that a BBC producer starts hunting around for a particular star himself to chair a new television series on astronomy, and he chooses you. And you begin that record-breaking run of 17 years with the sky at night. And, of course, that producer is here tonight, uh. Paul. Paul Johnston. <laughs> when I heard this, when I heard you getting my head, I had a sort of feeling you'd be here. <laughs> and I have a sort of feeling you've never regretted that decision, Paul. Never, because I think Patrick is undoubtedly one of the best performers there is on television. Yeah. I'll give you an example. In the early days of the sky at night, uh, as you remember, it was always live in those days. There was no telerecording. Patrick was talking away when suddenly, into his mouth, flew a large fly. <laughs> well, as Patrick himself said, there was only one thing to do. He swallowed it and went <laughs> straight on talking. A great professional. I agree. Thank you, Paul John. Well, now, Patrick, as a scientist too, as well as a fly swallower, your reputation is worldwide. Wherever you travel around the globe, though lecturing, observing, advising, that village of yours in Selsey in Sussex is a firm base. And when you're home, there's nothing you enjoy more than a pastime that might surprise some of your uh, scientific pals in observatories around the world. A game that's right down to earth, village cricket. <laughs> Yes, they're all here, your chums from the Selsey cricket team, led by your club chairman, Ron Maidment. <laughs> Quiet, fellas, for a minute. We hear that oh, no. Patrick's the demon bowler far, of the far, team. Far, is that right? He's the reason right. they get the, they get the, he gets his batsman is they laugh so much at the other end as he's bowling. <laughs> <laughs> we can see an example of that but devastating no. action of yours right oh, now, no. Patrick, because it's been captured on film for the benefit of future cricketing generations. What? Oh. Oh. <laughs> well done, and thank you, the Selsey Cricket Club. Thank you. Ah, oh, they're saying here. Oh now, that's Patrick Moore, amateur cricketer off duty. But on duty, Patrick, you're a space professional. And when the first space flights began in the 1960s, the professionals turned to the man who first wrote that guide to the moon. You traveled to America to lecture to the National Aeronautics and Space Agency on the conditions that astronauts would be likely to find on the surface of the moon. And what a thrill it must have been for you to realize how accurate your prediction had been. And these pictures here, beamed from the lunar surface, had a special significance for you because the astronaut here exploring the surface of the moon on the Apollo 15 mission is your good friend Dave Scott. And that same Dave Scott is at NASA headquarters, where, as you know, there's great excitement over the splashdown of the crew from the latest space exploration Skylab 2. But for you, Patrick, he took time out to send you this message. Good evening, Patrick. Uh, if you remember, you and I worked together quite hard on Apollo 16 in Houston. In particular, I was impressed by the fact that you had predicted man would be on the moon before 1980 and you also predicted many things about the lunar surface which we found to be true. The program has sort of come to an end now but I'm sure in the future there'll be some other exciting places to explore and perhaps you can join us and uh, explore if not from the surface of the earth but also perhaps someday we'll have an observatory on the moon and you can help us operate that observatory. It's been pleasant being with you tonight and I'd like to wish you success and prosperity in the future. Thank you, Dave Scott. A tribute from a man who has walked on the moon to a man who, as a boy, half a lifetime ago, predicted that very thing would happen. Yeah, but Dave Scott has really done something, don't forget. So have you. Mrs. Moore, it all began at your home when you handed your young son a book that had captured your imagination. How do you feel tonight? I'm extremely glad to feel that he could take as a career something that he really likes and enjoys doing. 
and adds so much to. Patrick Moore, this is your life. Yeah. <laughs>